right, welcome. Welcome everyone to this to this webinar. I think we have people coming into the room. Good afternoon from the Netherlands. Um, good good morning to some. Good afternoon to others. We'll start in a few minutes. Just let's give a few more people to the chance to uh, to log on, and then we'll uh, we'll dive right in. And maybe uh, as we're waiting for more participants, please do not hesitate to introduce yourself as well using the chat box, um, your name, your expertise, and what is kind of the expectation for the next hour and a half, although we have a plan for you as well. Yes, everyone, this is um, a webinar where we hope to learn and also in interact and engage with you. So indeed, very interested to know who's with us uh, joining for this uh, for this session. Um, yeah, the chat box is open. Feel free to uh, to add. Good morning, Canada. Vivian, nice to have you with us here. Great. Munira, welcome. Yes, thanks. Great. Okay. I think it's uh, it's it's almost five. Um, it's four, almost five past uh, the hour. So I think we should we should start. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, on behalf of the organizers, Foresight for Food. My name is Bram Peters. I'm uh, working from the Netherlands uh, for Foresight for Food as global facilitator. And um, uh, together with me, I have as co-facilitator Ratana. And uh, together we'll be guiding you through. Yeah, Ratana, maybe you can introduce yourself. Um, good, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Ratana. I work for uh, FAO as a foresight planning specialist, and I was as well one of the lucky uh, fellow Brias. Uh, we'll tell you more later, but welcome to the webinar. Thanks, Ratana. Yeah. So welcome to this um, uh, Foresight for Food webinar on the frontiers of, of, of Foresight and Food. And um, this is the Back to the Past to Explore the Future webinar. And we're very excited to have a very interesting perspective about, about history and foresight together in this, in this webinar. And we have uh, a couple of guests as well who will be sharing uh, yeah, in insights and keynotes with us. Uh, and uh, we'll be taking you through a a interactive webinar and we'll hopefully also get your perspective and your ideas as we talk about this very interesting topic. So let me give you a brief outline of the session. So this is the welcome and opening. Uh, we'll have some introductory remarks as well from, from Foresight for Food and, and from Brias. We'll have a brief exercise to warm you up a bit and to help you to think a bit about how do we get uh, from history to, to the current situation to, to the future. Um, we have uh, two keynote speakers, Nel de Molinare uh, from uh, uh, Brias, as well as the Vrije Universiteit Brussels, and uh, Matthew Hannaford, who is also a Brias fellow and uh, working at Lincoln University. So very happy to have them with us here. Um, we will hear from them about what the, the work that they've been doing in the past years, the link between history and foresight. We'll also dive into a, into a case where we, we actually use and we think about this um, in, in the context of food systems. We'll be having a bit of discussion about that. Uh, there's also room for questions and, and comments to be added as we go along. Uh, we'll have breakout groups. So we'll also uh, go into murals and separate groups to discuss a bit more deeply about how you see this also in your practice and your ideas on this. 
and then we'll come back together to have a bit of a plenary discussion um, and uh, and some closing remarks also from our side. So that's overall the agenda that we have in store for you. And uh, we're looking forward to an interesting session. The session is about uh, one and a half hour. So indeed, keep in mind that we really like you to, to join us uh, throughout. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, write your comments in the chat. Uh, we will be recording this webinar as well, so we can upload this on our on our YouTube channel, uh, so it can be also viewed afterwards. So that's also uh, good for you to know. Um, I would like to maybe ask Ratna then to share a few opening words on behalf of Rias. Thank you so much, uh, Bram. And, and again, a very warm welcome to all of you. I'm very pleased to see how global is uh, the participants that we have today. Um, I'm not going to be very long. Uh, I just wanted to maybe just a couple of few words about what is BRIAS, which is uh, the Brixell uh, Institute for Advanced Studies, uh, which have been created about three years ago. And every year, welcome different uh, fellows under different team. And this is how Matthew, Nell, and I, with a couple of other colleagues, have been working together in the theme of past, present, and future of food, climate change, and sustainability. Um, why is that important? It's not just because we met for the first time over one month, but it was really an initiative from Brias, from Bruxelles University and the uh, Fried University in, uh, in Belgium, to break the silos of different disciplines. The break the silos is something that we talk a lot about, um, especially in discipline where we say that we are very into system thinking. Uh, but I have to say that it was really the first time that I was immersed to a new world, especially with historians. So with no further delay, I'm going to give the floor back to two of our keynote speaker of today, Dr. Mathieu and uh, Professor Ned, who are going to introduce you a bit more into deep history and how that could be as well related foresight plan about futures. I always say when we think about past and future, it's all having a meaning on what we are doing differently today. And I think that is really what's going to be the second part of that webinar is sharing our reflection and what Ratana, you're breaking up a bit. Differently and what we could do better. Um, as well as being together as a group. Um, yeah, Ratana, we, we heard you, but you broke up a little bit in the end. Um, thanks thanks for, for those introductory remarks. Um, I Before we move into the content, I'd like to give the word to, to Jim Woodhill, who is the lead for Foresight for Food and uh, also to share a bit, yeah, your perspective on this webinar and then why you think the interest, how, how it links to our work uh, as, an, as an initiative. Great, thank you. Thank you, Bram. Um, I think you can hear me okay? Yep. yep. Good. So um, good, mo good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. It's a real pleasure to have you all online. Um, I was, uh, been given a little bit of a hard time by my colleagues a few moments ago about looking so formal here. That's because I'm at the International Fund for Agricultural Development Governing Council meeting in Rome. But actually, interestingly, just in the opening of that meeting, there was a really strong message about really how turbulent the future world is going to be for what we're doing in food systems and in agriculture and how complex the whole set of issues that we're dealing are. are. And so I think the whole foresight thinking in, in my mind is really about trying to help us with a whole range of different stakeholders do two things. The first is, is be, be better prepared for the future by trying to understand what are some of the big things coming down the pipeline at us in terms of both opportunities and risks. And if we just think about the consequences of what people are eating, and if we think about the fact that by 2035, something like 51% of the world's population will be overweight or obese, and that will cost 3% of the global economy, which is a bigger hit to the global economy than what we suffered during the COVID crisis. So, I mean, you know, when you just start to think about that, it's huge issues. So how do we prepare for that? And alternatively, how do we see the opportunities in terms of maybe shifting to a completely different sort of diet, a much healthier diet that could have all sorts of opportunities for what different 
farmers and producers and value chains can engage in. I mean, we know at the moment, for example, that 3.1 billion people um, can't afford a healthy diet. So how do we think about those things? So that's the first part of um, foresight. And then the other part is really about how can we imagine a different future? How can we creatively imagine how things can be could be really different to, be, to create the opportunities to create a more desirable future? And that's where it sort of comes to the history. Because what we see, what we can imagine, what we can think about is deeply linked to, of course, our mindsets that formed historically. Um, how we can even understand what's going to happen in the future is shaped by our past understanding. So I think this sort of link between past, present and future is really, really critical, even though we're thinking about a foresight perspective. And the other thing I'd like to just say is we're really trying to make a very strong link in our foresight thinking to the whole idea of systemic change. So it's not just doing foresight, it's using the foresight thinking to try and bring some of the deeper structural changes in how we think, in how we work, in our politics to actually create a much better food system for the future. Now, you know, one of the big things in that is, of course, again, our mindsets. Um, we can't bring change in systems if we don't shift mindsets. We can't bring change in systems if we don't understand the deep political economy of what's going on and how that's deeply structured by past power relationships, past institutional structures. So I think this whole sense of how can we use the past to help us shape the future is a really, really fundamental part of, of how we need to be getting our heads around the whole foresight thinking. So we're super excited to, to have our, well, all of you online today, but also our two keynote speakers to, to really enliven our thinking about this. So again, thanks everybody for joining us and really looking forward to the session today. Thanks a lot, Jim, and really nice to have these words from you from the IFAD office in, in Rome. Um, lends a lot of weight to this meeting, I would say, so that's, uh, that's great. Um, I need, just indeed to reflect a bit how we're connecting from all across the world. I see people logging in from uh, Reunion Island. I see Nairobi there. I see Brazil. I see uh, colleagues from the UK. Um, Uganda is there as well, so really nice to see how we're coming together across uh, different uh, time zones and different continents as well. Um, just to add a bit there that indeed this is the idea of, of what we uh, envisage as, a, as an initiative. It's a global network where we're really connecting different people all across uh, different sectors, uh, domains and, and, um, and initiatives. And I think that's also why we're organizing these kind of webinars to, to connect further. So without further ado, let's let's keep also introducing ourselves also in the in the in the chat. Uh, but we'll also start with with warming you up with a few uh, a few questions uh, just to get you a bit in the mindset of of what we want to discuss with you today. So we have a couple of questions for you, and uh, we'd like you to uh, answer uh, the question as you see it, uh, the correct answer in the chat. And let's see how much you already know about. Um, history and, and foresight. Ratna, do you want to ask the first question? Yes, Maybe sure. Could, yeah. <laughs> yes. So I, I, I will ask the, the first question. I'm really sorry, there's no prize yet, uh, but if, please do not feel shy to share uh, your response here. Um, it's a bit of a tricky uh, game as well, where we are trying as well to um, help you to think about food in general and the history behind it. So my first question to all of you here in this webinar is where are potatoes originally from? A, United States, B, Ireland, C, Peru, D, India, E, China. So just type it and um, I can see already some response on the chat. Brams and all, like I, I see that this is very 101 for most of our participants. Um, they're all getting it very right so far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I tried to confuse people by adding the uh, potato eaters painting, which is a Dutch painting, um, but uh, I guess it didn't confuse people. No, no, no. I think we have very clever ones. So I, congratulations to those that respond correctly, which are most of the people here. Um, should we go to the next slide then, uh, as being the right answer, of course, being Peru? 
Yes. So the next question is, um, this is about the first vegetarian campaign. And the question is, in which of the following movements or organizations is credited with launching the first vegetarian campaign? I think nowadays there's a discussion about vegetarianism and veganism uh, in, in different settings. Um, but which, which organization started this, or at least started a campaign uh, on this uh, topic? Type your answers in the chat. I right, hear there's a bit less certainty in the group, which is good. We are getting there <laughs> to the uncertain moment. <laughs> Good. Let's keep typing, people. I see. I see people saying, "Well, it's the the uh, Pythagoreans in ancient Greece," which is an interesting uh, guess. I see question marks there. I see uh, three as well. Ratna, do you want to share the answer? I actually will say that it was the number four, but I, um, I might be totally wrong and it's number five. Nell, do you want to answer this one? Yeah. So it was the um, Vegetarian Society in the UK oh. in 1847. I'm a very bad historian. I actually didn't have a clue. I'm so sorry now. <laughs> yeah, but this uh, is interesting to know that it was already um, in 1847. So that's a really interesting find. Eh? So um, this uh, this idea of vegetarianism, you know, it goes in ups and downs. I mean, obviously in Buddhism, there's also a lot of reflection about this. But in terms of campaigning, this already started quite early. Good. So the next question, Ratna, do you want to ask it? Yes, yeah, sure. All right. Um, how did canned food appear in our food system? Um, A, the need for long lasting food during the American Civil War. B, Napoleon, so another type of war as well, needed to feed his army. C, the British Navy requirement for preserved food. D, the Industrial Revolution creating a demand for prepackaged uh, food. E, the discovery of vitamin preservation in canned fruits and vegetables. So let's have some answers in the chat. Yeah, we're starting to have some answer here. I hope you're also inspired by the link to Andy Warhol, who created art from cans, which I think is an interesting uh, inspiration okay there's more people coming in the chat i see yeah also not uh that clear answers yet there's a diversity of of responses so last chance to fill your answer someone has okay someone yeah someone got two answers into one <laughs> dnc <laughs> good okay so the answer is the answer is b is Napoleon needed to feed his army? Um, so again, we, we see how innovations uh, appear as well in a time that was needed and generated things that was at scale and have revolutionized our own food system. Yeah, and there was the need, of course, to preserve food for long trips. Uh, and I think that's also where sauerkraut came from, but I don't know if what pack it was, it was in tin. So uh, I think that's a different uh, way of moving it. Um, okay, the last question we have for you is about soy sauce. And it's been believed to have been accidentally discovered, like many foodstuffs. Um, I think beer is among them as well, and wine. Um, but of which product uh, was it found out as a byproduct? Uh, was that fish sauce, miso paste, hoisin sauce, Sichuan sauce, or oyster sauce? So let's see if, if people from various continents know this answer. Type your answers in the chat, please. OK. 
Okay, answers are coming in. I'm seeing a mix of uh, E's, D's, and B's. Of right and wrong answer. Please, Ram, tell us <laughs> which one is the right. So the answer is miso paste, because uh, miso is also um, a, a soy-based product. And uh, yeah, it's also a, 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 not, a vegetarian uh, dish. So the other ones, uh, oyster sauce and fish sauce, would, would fall off as well. Um, so some of you had it, had it correct. Great. Good. So this is just a way of, of just warming you up a bit in terms of, yeah, linking also about what we know and, and also keeping an eye on that, you know, these things uh, sometimes happen for, for various reasons, whether engineered or, or accidental. And um, with that note, I'd like to um, ask Nell to take us through uh, the, the keynote together with Matthew. Thank you. Can you share your screen? Thank you. Yeah. Um, Matthew, do you mind sharing the screen? My PowerPoint is choosing this exact moment to act really weird. <laughs> of course. Sure. Sorry, just let me open the presentation. Okay, well, I can start with uh, thanking Foresight for Food. Thank you, Bram. Thank you, Jim, for inviting us um, because I am not a foresight planner at all. As you know, I am a historian of food and humanitarian aid and uh, really the reconstruction in a broad sense uh, after the First World War. And Matthew, uh, I'm a historian, by the way, at the Vrije Universiteit Brussel. So I'm talking to you from Brussels right now. And Matthew um, is affiliated at the University of Lincoln and his expertise is on environmental and food histories in Southern Africa from the 16th to the 19th century. So what we will do in this uh, quite short keynote is explain what our historical expertise really has to offer, might have to offer, to scenario plan planners working today uh, on future food change and transformation. So next slide, please. Um, as uh, Ratana said, in April last year, we spent a month in Brussels thinking about and discussing uh, the link between history and the future of food with this group of people. Um, and the reason why um, they were all invited to Brussels was as Ratana said, the Brussels Institute for Advanced Studies, uh, BRIAS, and as the academic co-director of that institute last year, I had the pleasure to invite uh, these experts to reflect on how to integrate historical thinking. Um, next slide, please. So the idea for this uh, was sparked actually in 2021 uh, during a conversation uh, with Ratana, and we were talking about food transformations. And I have to say from all the social scientists working on food and agriculture evolutions I spoke during that time uh, for my work at Brias, I felt I had the least in common with Ratana. Um, she was a foresight planner, a futurist, I'm a historian, um, so I had this kind of cliche view of futurists and which is on the right and I'm so sorry about that because I know your work involves a lot more than that uh, and I felt Perhaps I also had a sort of cliche view of myself working on in archives and really squarely focused on the past and on historical facts and nuances and trying to explain the present. So I was working with, I am working with all documents and in the archives. And she was looking at the opposite direction from me, uh, trying to change the present, uh, discussing different scenarios, using models and data. Um, so these are, are of course, uh, very tired pictures of both of us, but um, it is true that historians and foresight planners are hardly ever uh, in the same rooms, digital or physically. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but when uh, Ratana actually were first placed in the same rooms, and at first I have to admit it was a team's room, <laughs> um, we discovered that we actually have a lot of commonalities in what we were doing on a ba daily basis and how we think. Uh, we both start from today, from present day challenges. And um, as historians, we see uh, the past as infinite, of course, 
but we choose what we cover, which topics, which people, which events, and that is inevitably in, informed by where we are today. Our perspectives are very much colored uh, by today's events and perspectives. So um, the second commonality is that we both know how to deal with uncertainties. And with that, I mean that we both work with completely incomplete data sets, both foresight planners and historians. We don't have all the information of what happened in the past or what is going to happen in the future. We are dealing with gaps in the data. And uh, historians are dependent on what historical figures decided to record and keep for the future. Uh, so both historians and foresight planners have to figure out ways and uh, methodologies to fill in the gaps and extrapolate in a scientific and really informed way. Um, thirdly, we both know that there are multitudes of futures and histories. There is not one version of the future or of the past. We have historical facts. Someone died, uh, there, there was a famine. There. But these can have very different causes and consequences depending on who you are studying, um, what perspective you are employing, and what records you have. And that's why historians can actually have very different accounts or interpretations of the exactly the same events. And finally, both scenario planners and historians, I think, know how to kind of weave all these facts and interpretations into a very powerful, appealing, convincing story. So uh, Ratana and I found out that there are actually similarities in the ways that we as historians are reconstructing past events and how futurists are constructing future scenarios. Um, but uh, as you can see in the next slide, right now the integration of historical information in the foresight planning process is very limited. It is lim often limited to the first steps of that process of contextualizing um, the case study at the start of the planning. It's um, often called mapping the system. Um, historical data is used to get to know the case study and, and really looking at developments from the recent past. Um, but we argue that uh, that way, foresight planners really miss a lot of stories and histories that might be very useful. How disasters struck in different parts of communities, the traditions and coping mechanisms that helped communities deal with them, but also histories of oppression and resistance and agencies within communities. Um, this lack of historical micro or macro data is not necessarily due to a lack of interest we think in the part at the part of foresight planners, but it's definitely uh, due to a um, uh, constraint in the availability of resources, of course, faced with the choice, choice between an expert in agroecological systems or a historian of agriculture, who do you pick? Um, and we also have to look at ourselves as historians. We are also often very wary of research being instrumentalized and or in a way simplified to fit in a certain framework. So, um, so and this results in a really hard yet in, in, in a sense artificial line that is drawn between the past and the present or the future. And the result is often a limited view on the past. And thanks to Ratana, we have um, a beautiful illustration of that you see on the right, um, a li limited view on the past, which is very short term, very one dimensional, and which of course has an impact on how foresight planners view the future. But um, we think, and uh, next slide please, that historical expertise is important. And we found during our month of thinking about that, that uh, Historical inquiry and methodology can really add to the process of scenario writing in two separate fundamental ways. Uh, I'm gonna explain the first one and Matthew uh, will talk later about the second one. First, we, firstly, we can look at history as a sort of laboratory. Uh, we can think about historical cases and insights from those cases and how they can be applied outside that specific time frame or location to help predict future cases that have really similar characteristics. I will explain later. 
The, the second is place-based histories of food systems in specific countries or regions or even communities that have been hit by similar food crisis um, in the past and digging up local knowledge that has been hidden or unheard of, um, ignored, and use that knowledge as really essential data to construct very uh, fine-tuned, uh, realistic future scenarios. Um, but Matthew will tell you more about that. First, I want to explain what we mean by the first way and how we think history is a good, really testing ground, how we can draw lessons uh, from historical research and the insights of historians, mostly social economic historians. Uh, next slide, please. People think that climate change is unprecedented, that the scale and the pace of the hazard is novel, and that is indeed true. But humankind, as you can see in this graph, has unfortunately quite a lot of experience with food system failures. Uh, as you can see here, Europe has suffered many uh, wide-scale famines in the last 800 years and many more local subsistence crises that are not on the graph here with just as many different causes and outcomes. Some of those might be quite similar to what we are experiencing uh, today. Uh, next slide, please. So social economic historians have been reflecting on this for many decades. Uh, what causes famine? How have specific communities coped with disasters? And how flood or droughts or harvest fail failures have uh, hit different groups within those communities? And it is thanks to historical research that we know that famines are man-made, actually. And here you see a few uh, examples of uh, historical research. The last one uh, is a recent publication that is open access and where Matthew uh, is a co-author or co-editor as well. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so um, in many ways, um, as you will read in that uh, vol volume and in other work of historians, the mechanisms and institutions that societies have used in the past to deal with these threats uh, have many similarities and are in fact direct uh, uh, ones, uh, the, the direct um, um, predecessors of the ones that we use now to deal with floods and droughts and fires. So the fundamental nature of the formal and the informal institutions, collective actions, markets, local authorities, welfare agencies, uh, disaster relief, um, and many strate uh, strategies communities have employed might not have changed much of as much as we think. And there are important lessons to draw from how people reacted to food catastrophes. Um, and I'm going to give you one concrete example from Belgian history, because I'm an expert, of course, in Belgian history. What you see here in this illustration on the left is uh, Belgian women and some men, but mostly women, waiting in a food line during the German occupation of Belgium uh, in the First World War. Um, as you might know, there was um, famine or almost famine here uh, in Belgium during the First World War. And we know from historical research that food lines were places where famine victims and particular women were waiting together, gathering, started talking, perhaps, perhaps complaining, but also started organizing and started to plan collective actions. We saw that in Ghent here in Belgium in different cities. We also saw that a few years earlier uh, in San Francisco after the earthquake and the flower riots in July 1906. Um, this information, and this is just a little anecdote, but it might be useful for gender-focused relief, for example. It challenges the gendered separation of the private and the public sphere. So history, although it can be a very different case study, a very different uh, time frame or location, it can provide essential information on how um, people dealt with famine, what, what were the causes and outcomes of disasters for food systems on different social groups. 
Mark Twain, the author Mark Twain famously said, history does not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And what historians can teach uh, is not markets or goods or bad to mitigate hunger, for example, or international intervention is good or bad. But what historians can do um, is say why in a particular set of circumstances that might bear similarities to another specific set of circumstances, these institutional arrangements led to successes or failures. What were the main factors, the triggers, the trends in a certain situation? What can we learn from that? Uh, next slide. But there is also a less general, very specific way of using history to make better future scenarios. And that is what we called place-based uh, histories. And that makes a direct connection between the lost or often ignored voices and experiences of the past and the predictions of the future. And for that, I am very happy to give the floor to Matthew. Many thanks for that, Nell. So just to, I want to give a flavor of um, this, the second way that we've, we've spoken about here. And on the one hand, this concerns the institutional context for decision-making um, and interventions in food systems. And on the other hand, it involves uncovering the, the bottom-up local knowledges, voices, agencies of communities who perhaps aren't well represented in the historical record, but who have undergone food system transformation in the past. So just to give a brief flavor of, of how this how this looks practically in the historical record in archives that myself and Nell spend a great deal of time in. Um, perhaps most important or at least most um, widely used by uh, many historians are, are the textual narratives that, that we're left with from, um, from often state uh, actors, uh, for example, government departments um, who left, particularly in the 20th century, quite rich documentation about interventions in food systems, various stages, the knowledges that were involved in making those decisions, understandings of local contexts. And this often gives us this kind of official view um, but historians are, are, are well um, versed in and adept at um, using various techniques, historical methodologies um, to work with these sources to understand um, the kind of, yes, the, the decision making logics that, that led to those decisions and indeed led to the outcomes, but also trying to uncover those local voices through um, certain readings of these historical sources, these dominant official narratives that we get as Jim was talking about the the, the mindsets um, and try and confront these and, and try and uncover the local voices and and um, uh, actors in in those sources and equally it's important to to simply read along the grain of these sources as we might say as well just to look at how decision making evolved over time how decision making actors um, understandings of, of, of food systems and, and context evolved over time in order to get away from this kind of meta narrative and think about different actors and how that changed over time to break that down into this more kind of disaggregated picture. And an example of this is just uh, shown in the bottom right here, which is a passage from uh, the chief commissioner of Matabili land in 1980, uh, 1898 rather, um, in, in Zimbabwe, um, who discusses a, um, a locust plague at the height of a multi-year drought um, and rinder pest outbreak. Um, so really a, a, a compounding chain of hazards. And we can see just in this passage, um, just how many times, even though this is written from this official line, how many times the local population and agency is mentioned in the text. So we have discussions about the, the economic impacts of the locusts. We have discussions about the means of coping, but also we have this, um, interestingly, this kind of um, link formed between um, the locust outbreak and the arrival of white settlers in the region. So we can, even, even with this, this kind of dominant narratives that we're left with in archives, we can still uncover local voices and knowledges. So just to give a bit more of a deep dive about what we can do with this, this knowledge um, and these, these sources, which are often qualitative as well, 
um, and this is from my own work. Um, so one of the things I've done is to, to work with this qualitative data in, in quite a systematic way, um, and not just on a local scale, but across a wider scale, but that allows those kind of deep dive local perspectives to, to come out of this research is I've assembled a database of textual narratives around food systems, food stuffs, food ways um, in the deep historical record across Southern and Eastern Africa. And up to 1840 alone, so really before the intensification of colonial rule, that has yielded um, around 2,700 observations of the presence or absence of foodstuffs, but also the um, uh, markers of their relative importance of production practices and of knowledges. So really this is using qualitative data in yes in, in the in the sense of the breadth that we the, the depth rather that we most associate with with um, the advantage of qualitative data, but also using that across a kind of breadth that is 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 less commonly um, associated with qualitative data too. And in doing this, I've I've been able to look at, um, as you see in the bottom left, comparative but also place-based trajectories of um, dominant staple crops within certain regions of, um, well, in this case, Mozambique, the, the four examples that are shown here. And to understand how that changed over time in response to, but also um, uh, perhaps in, in um in isolation from these wider factors that we often associate with driving food system change. Um, and if we just pick out an example here, so the, 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 pal the panel labeled Mozambique, which is um, concerning the, the communities opposite um, Mozambique Island, Ilia de Mozambique, which was the, the sort of colonial center of, of governance in, in uh, Mozambique uh, from the, the 16th century onwards, we can see that from the earliest records, sorghum is, is pretty much predominant in um, the, the predominant staple crop. But as we move into the late 18th century, there's a, a significant shift going on where sorghum becomes really quite secondary to, to cassava, which was introduced to the region around the same time. And incidentally, this, um, this, this shift also happened at the same time as the, the Eastern African slave trade um, started to grow rapidly, and also when the demand for portable but storable foodstuffs rapidly increased too. So how how is this kind of deeper knowledge, um, you know, not just going back decades but multiple centuries into the past? How is that relevant to to help us understand the outcomes of, of present day interventions in food systems? Well, to, to, to look at this and try and partly answer that question, I'll, I'll stick with the Mozambican case, but I'll particularly draw on work by Professor Heidi Gengenbach, who's also a historian, um, but has worked with, with um, ethnographic methods, household surveys, and, and, and other wider methods in, in, in social science, um, who, who studied a cassava value chain and its implementation, perhaps its maladaptive outcomes um, in, in a part of Mozambique. So just to give a bit of deeper context to this, this initiative, um, between 2009 and 2011, SA, SAB Miller and the Dutch Agricultural Development and Trading um, Company partnered to develop a value chain for cassava-based Impala beer, which you see over on the right side here. And the aim was really to commercialize what was conceived or what was thought of as a subsistence crop, i.e. cassava, um, for for poverty reduction, but also to improve food and nutrition security. And the idea was that farmers would use their income to replace um, cassava with allegedly uh, superior uh, purchased foods. So the initial implementation in the northern part of Mozambique, where I was speaking about um, just on the previous slide, was considered a relative success. Um, there were awards given from, for example, the, the, the Beverage Innovation Awards in 2013. And so in 2015-16, the project was upscaled. It was rolled out in, in southern Mozambique, um, in, in Yambane province, where cassava was also a key crop, but where women controlled its production. And there was a key difference in the two areas, um, in that unlike in the north, the rollout in the south, and especially the Zavala region, was met with 
negative reactions and to some extent unintended consequences. So as you see um, on, on the bottom left, um, first of all, there was significant anger over the very low purchase prices um, available for cassava cultivated um, and sold to the to the, um, uh, the value chain. And this was premised on the assumption that female growers would be lacking commercial experience and would be really desperate for any kind of market outlet. And then secondly, despite the cash income realized, there was rather than an increase in dietary diversity, there was a, a decline as there was a shift towards processed foods like uh, white bread, like pasta that were quite symbolic of class status and had been so since, since colonial times. And then a couple of other consequences were that, excuse me, that um, there was extensive forest clearance for um, the new fields. And this reduced the availability and in intake of, of, of micronutrients um, from forage, plant and animal foods. And then fourthly, um, due to brewery demands, there was a shift away from uh, sweet drought tolerant varieties of cassava to more bitter, less drought tolerant uh, varieties. So how could that local but deep historical information that I was speaking about a couple of slides ago have maybe shifted the, the assumptions and maybe the outcomes that were seemingly maladapted in the south of Mozambique? Well, if we just take a brief but um, look at, at what we might call a usable past of, of um, cassava in, in the area, um, we, we've already seen that cassava was introduced at this time of the growing um, Eastern African slave trade when the demand for portable and um, storable sustenance was, was growing quite rapidly in the region. And in the early 19th century, we already see evidence in the documentary record of cassava being valued both for consumption, but critically for exchange. It was, it was becoming a marketable crop. And... Despite this deeper history of commercialization, which, by the way, also um, grew further when there was overland um, labor migration to work in, in um, the mines in, in, in modern day South Africa, the Portuguese colonial government in Mozambique um, sort of relegated cassava to this, this bracket of a, um, a, of a subsistence crop in an emerging set of binaries around um, the producers and uses of foodstuffs. But cassava marketing continued um, throughout the colonial period, and it was really only interrupted by uh, the period of civil war in the 70s to, to early 90s. But even then, in the post-war context, there was a, a really a big bounce back of cassava marketing um, when you had a large amount of displaced uh, residents from, from Inyambane provi uh, province to, to the capital Maputo, and you had the growth of um, uh, uh, truck trades in, in cassava along the highway that was built um, around the same time. So as we can see, far from being a subsistence crop um, or even commercialization of cassava being a recent phenomenon, Cassava in southern Mozambique has this deep and very much integrated history as both a dietary staple and a commercial foodstuff. And if we miss this kind of deep place-based context, we risk resurrecting those kind of colonial characterizations of African societies and food systems. So in this case, we can see how historical knowledge can prove quite vital in avoiding those maladaptive outcomes. And just before I hand back over to Nell, I just wanted to briefly mention that um, there are other sources available for, for looking particularly at the, the, the bottom up local knowledges, um, narrative resistances, agencies. And one of those is, is from oral histories. And that can include oral histories that have been recorded in the past, but also as a new form of um, data collection to, to really uncover and empower those those local narratives of marginalization and food system transformation that have occurred in the past. Um, there's a couple of examples uh, that I've used in, in my own research here from, uh, from uh, KwaZulu Natal in, in South Africa. These were recorded way back in the early 20th century and, and hence sort of give a, a, a much deeper history of 
in the left case, um, crop pests um, relating to sorghum, and in the right in the right hand case, um, a famine that occurred in the early 19th century, which interestingly gives us quite um, explicit insights into um, local connections between climate, conflict, and food. Um, and these are these are quite rich local um, forms of evidence, which often lack in this. Um, as, as, as some of you may be familiar with this kind of quantitative heavy um, climate conflict literature that we see today, um, which has been particularly um, prevalent across uh, sub-Saharan Africa. So I'd like to hand back over to Mel at this point. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, so as the cassava case really illustrates, um, when foresight planners are building present and future roadmaps or pathways for food system transformations or system changes for specific regions and communities, and not only they can, but they should rely on the local knowledge on the food system that is existing and that we are reconstructs, reconstructing. And those uh, and historians in those contexts are reconstructing um, and it should really be an essential part of the data, data ecosystem not just at the start when mapping or contextualizing the system but especially in the next stages when foresight planners are thinking about drivers of system changes about key trends and also and this is really something that is showcased by uh, the, the Mozambique case that Matthew was talking about, about the implications of different scenarios on different actors, because nothing is new and often these communities actually have experience and expertise uh, that foresight planners can learn from. Um, that is not really uh, often captured in quantitative data, but and in oral testimonies and in qualitative data. And you need someone to interpret that data and who have experience with interpret, uh, with really reading and learning uh, from those data sets. Uh, so I hope that we have convinced you of the value of historical knowledge on food system and crisis, and hope that we can contribute to enlarging the horizons and really, um, make future planning more plausible, more practical, but also more open, inclusive, and creative, uh, as you can see on this graph. And again, thank you, Ratana, for creating that. Um, so uh, I want to conclude uh, with uh, a few following up questions uh, that we are struggling with. And that is, I think for me, the most important one is how can scenario planners put that in practice? those historical insights and really incorporate this historical methodology, how they can, how can they really enlarge horizons and implement complex data, uh, multifaceted data, historical information in a practical way? And how can we make, we make that mainstream in foresight planning? Uh, so that is the main question that we have for you uh, in the next half hour. Thank you so much um, for listening to us and inviting historians to the room. Thanks, Nell. Uh, you can um, stop sharing your screen, uh, Matthew. Let's open the room. Um, for, a, for a few responses and reactions. I mean, this is a super interesting presentation. And I think one of those things, indeed, it's not, uh, I think there's a lot of, you know, different perspectives that actually Heinz or sort of historians and, and foresight uh, experts and, and practitioners are using. And uh, I'm already seeing some comments coming in in the chat. So we have a bit of time to, to hear from a few uh, people who want to, who want to uh, respond. Um, I'm looking at, uh, yeah, Anyone else who wants to indeed add? I see there's a reflection on the need to incorporate indigenous knowledge in, in, in current food systems. I think that's that's definitely critical. Um, Munira, do you want to say something about this um, in response to the presentation by Nell and, and Matthew? 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Munira here from Uganda. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Matthew, for that wonderful presentation. It was actually an eye-opener, uh, throwing more light uh, on the importance of uh, indigenous knowledge in uh, in uh, in informing our current thinking uh, of what we actually also find within communities when we do various interventions is the fact that uh, communities often have knowledge uh, about particular problems and they're willing to address them, but we seemingly walk in with different um, or, or our own thinking of what the challenges are and what the solutions should be. So uh, what I take away here is that uh, in the end, what we need to really focus on is the, the critical role communities can play in transforming their um, their their current situations, especially within food system planning and transformation. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for that, uh, Munira. I think this is a really good start to the discussion. Um, I think maybe also in the interest of time, I think we want to get into the group work. Uh, as well, um, shall I shall I show you very briefly the mural that we will be working in? So we'll send you off to. We'll have four different groups, and you have a chance also to to get to know each other a little bit. Uh, the idea is that we have a couple of guiding questions, and I think uh, uh, Nell already pointed to a number of those uh, those key areas of interest that we want to explore together with you. I mean, we're bringing two fields of of uh, well, actually, you could say three fields together in terms of also bringing in foresight. Uh, and, and food system transformation expertise uh, as well. Um, we have a number of questions that we'd like to tackle. And essentially the central question is, how can we make the connection between history and historical perspectives as well as foresight? X, okay, sorry, something's going wrong. Can you see my screen? Okay, I think so. Uh, I just uh, lost connection for a second. Um, so the central question is, what makes the connection between history and foresight relevant uh, to you and, and to this to this field? But there's a number of sub-questions we'd like to tackle in different groups. And it's really up to your group to, to tackle a, a number of questions that you find interesting. So the first question is, how can we draw from historical knowledge uh, for foresight uh, work in food systems, maybe also drawing from your own experiences there. Another question is, what are key drivers of food systems change from a historical perspective? I think the presentation from Nell really pointed to, you know, drivers being drivers of change, but also continuity. I think that was also the story about history, not per se repeating, but rhyming uh, as well. And then the third question is also what Jim was referring to is, you know, what is the narratives and what is the power behind uh, dominant mindsets that sort of come from history and keep influencing how we talk about the future of food systems even today. So in your groups, uh, try to get into a nice discussion about this. Uh, try to capture a few of your thoughts uh, on different post-its. So you can just grab different post-its from the corner of the, of the board and you can just pull them in and, and just start typing. Uh, we'll try to divide ourselves as a team among the different groups as well so we can help to to facilitate and if need uh, if need be also take down some notes. Um, but essentially let the discussion go where, where you'd like to uh, head. Um, we'll give you about 15 minutes for this. So a bit short, I realize, but also in, it, it will be nice to, to come back and have a bit of plenary discussion to, to hear about what you discuss. So if hopefully that's clear, if there's any questions, please feel free to, to, to ask. Um, we'd like to send you off to four different groups. We have four different mural boards. So you can see, you find the one that you belong to and then start uh, using that one for your thoughts. Um, uh, I think that's all the instructions I, I need to give. Uh, Ratana, did I forget anything? Um, no, all good. I see that the group currently is about 18 people. So that's really great to have that 15 minutes just to get to know each other, to just really share with no shy. Um, and, and really reflect. I, I think uh, here the idea is to bring some kind of practical recommendations about how to work better together. I think that if you are all here as well uh, today and that you kind of engage with Foresight for Food, you may you understand as well that there is an urgent need to transform our food system. So the practicality as well of our reflection need to reflect on what we could do better today. Um, that's all. 
great. Um, the link to the mural board is also now in the chat. So you can also click on it and have a look yourself. Um, let's go off to the different rooms and um, we'll see you back in about uh, 15 minutes. So our... in foresight foresight uh, research but yeah i've been um, interacting with um, methodologies in foresight but i haven't actually practically used them which i would be really interesting uh, interested in doing um, because um, i've written a couple of ideas with matt actually and he was looking at the the historical part and i was looking at the future so it, the questions that you are actually asked are some of the things that we've been thinking with matt and uh trying to visualize how we could do that in in real sense so yeah interesting presentations yeah, yeah. Uh, Ilias, can you hear me Um, I'm not sure if Ilias is present, actually. Well, now we can just uh, start uh, the conversation between the two of us. <laughs> so you're an economist. Interesting. Yes. 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 So you're mostly... I, I'm, I'm kind of curious on what kind of data sets you're using. Because it's that's also it's a question of finding a common language, but also a mm. common way of looking at sources and the data, I guess. Yeah, I think it's what you guys talked about criticizing heavily. As economists, we are heavy on secondary data and large data sets. So my experience is mostly using uh, empirical data. Um, to explain food security mostly. So um, a lot of micro data is out there that I use, um, very limited on macro data. And also, and yeah, so mostly economics of food security is what I look into. Oh, but really micro data. I would yeah. expect the opposite. But no, my... actually, micro data is quite, is, yeah, there's a lot of micro secondary data out there being collected by FAO, World Bank. I use a lot of World Bank data myself. What, what is that? World Bank. The World oh, Bank. World Bank. Yeah. Okay. So can you give an example, just out of curiosity? But it's not related to foresight, though. Um, yeah. Yeah, for a few examples. Um, maybe looking at healthy diets. So if I'm looking at healthy diets, I will look at food consumption patterns for households and trying to look at maybe their consumption patterns, um, their yeah, sensitivity surveys. to certain, those, yeah. Yeah, I'm using that from the 1920s, the exact yeah. same data, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, I important. found surveys, historical surveys by mm. nutritionists working in Belgium uh, mm -hmm. on uh, children's food patterns uh, mm. It's actually filled out by the children themselves, which is yeah. quite interesting. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. But I don't know why I've tried to really avoid doing children's or data set focusing on children because of the limitation of maybe looking at other measurements beyond that because sometimes I relate that to health outcomes mm -hmm. or, or or cost implications yes. and things like that so with health sometimes it's quite difficult with children um, mm -hmm. doing studies so I try to <laughs> but it'll be interesting to look at that yeah well they were thinking about that as well in the 1920s so they actually had school doctors coming in and like looking at their teeth looking mm. at their skeleton things like that um, yeah mm. right after the first world war to really look at the implications of the war in yes health. and I think it's interesting because it's saying in group two, how can we draw from historical knowledge for foresight work in food systems? And just the way you've said it, looking at historical way of how they looked at healthy diets, for example, and how we can translate that into the future, thinking now um, the benefits that such practices that they did in the past could be used in the future and it's yeah. more sustainable or in a very sustainable way food practices just um yes i think so uh but also more how we can do that um yeah so um uh, really really nice to be part of this thank you uh, ratana and good to see you john i think i met you in montpellier so everybody went to montpellier Except Hervé, we didn't meet you in person yet, but the three of us did at one point. I'm sure it will happen in the near future. And I, and I was in Montpellier uh, recently uh, for a meeting with the CG Center with uh, Iri, so <laughs> amazingly. Oh, okay, so with the, the Rice Center as well. So, um, okay, so mm. you, you, will, you will have seen uh, Patrick. Uh, well, I, I um, basically I, I am uh, there for meeting with the the CIRAD and also the CG yeah. Center because that's basically the the place hosting all the different CG Center, and mm -hmm. we had a meeting with the International Rice Research Institute uh, in uh, in Montpellier in, uh, in November. I, I, work, I was working for the CG uh, before I was uh, joining the UN for ten years. Um, all right. I, I know that beast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The one CG now, yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. It, it was not the one CG back in my time, I can tell you. <laughs> but um, here is like the, the uh, mirror that was uh, introduced by, um, by Brands. We don't need to go directly into that, but maybe if you feel like one question is quite interesting for you, um, I feel you really a lot, uh, John, when you are exploring this idea of uh, heresy. Um, a lot of, of the policymaker I work in the region here, they're asking me all the time, are we making the same mistake as before? And I really can't tell because there is very few that is being reported about mistake and everything is usually glorious so that there is one narrative and it's very difficult to understand what is a mistake because you have always winner and loser. So it's it kind of, you know, it, it is a very difficult uh, way to be very objective looking at the past um, and definitely like the, this need of having more historians that are equipped with methods that can help us to define a little bit more those narrative of the past are, are extremely useful for our work. Um, so looking at those different um, one, I, I feel very attracted with the green color um, and that go with okay. John and yours as well, which is about who control the narrative and how does it in, influence dominant mindsets. Um, mm -hmm. If that's okay, I mean, it, it's very relevant as well in Asia. It's very relevant with rice. It's very relevant with the whole uh, variety of rice and crops that you have outside the region as well. So, yeah. I think uh, we can move to the group four uh, section of the 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 mural, which is I think a bit to the going down. Um, mm. Four, four. Perfect. Because we're group four. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Super. Thank but, you. But I, 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 again, I come back to this idea. What's really important is is how does how has thinking changed? I mean, that's the fundamental issue, I think, is how thinking has changed and how thinking needs to change. 
Um, I mean, the, the, thinking about all these food systems is is fine, but it's kind of a bit technical. I'm I'm trying to get the big picture here and how, for example, one of the things I wrote as a heresy in this piece I've written is that the Keynesian model of economy was a fantastic development after the Second World War, but it's past its sell by its its sell by date now. I mean, it's not the economic model that we need for the 21st century. And that's a heresy. People will say I'm a heretic because of that. So we need to think about uh, really how thinking needs to change. And this is why I've written this thing about developing, you know, what are the eight heresies of the 21st century? Because the 21st century cannot be like the 20th century if we are going to have any chance of survival. Yeah, if, if I can build on, on that, I think there is, I, I did not um, comment on, on, on your question, sorry for that, regarding the, the webinar, but something that came to my mind was a meeting that took place in Bangkok uh, several years ago, organized by the FAO on, on food system. And um, the um, it, it was pretty well organized, by the way, with a lot of countries sharing how they are structuring their food system, mainly across Asia. <coughs> and there was a, a kind of consensus on basically on what you said, that it has to be changed. It has to be changed in the light of, number one, the diet, which is not something that we mention enough, but what is the most sustainable diet for the human beings, uh, even not considering the scarcity on resources, just what is healthy. And, and what came out from the, the meeting was, there was three times more people uh, taking the the risk of dying uh, simply because it's they are overweighted mm -hmm. compared to com compared to be underweight uh, undernourished. If I all right, so it, uh, of course there there is still a lot of uh, attention and traction on on people that they don't get enough food on a daily basis. But nowadays it changed as well that there are too many people yeah. eating too much food. Yes. And, and we know what are the recipes for success in terms of diet. So for me, the heresy is, or something that needs to be changed is, can we simply uh, take a, a deep look on what are the best diet for the human beings, uh, you know, in, in every different, in all different countries, promote those countries. I've been working in Myanmar for years, and this is a place where the diet is absolutely perfect. I mean, it's in terms of balance between carbohydrates, and, and yeah. the proteins coming from the plants. Unfortunately, the food system that you see now in place in Myanmar is turning to be very much westernized more and more. Mm -hmm. And the food system is going to take basically the opposite direction of where this country was up to now. And that was the right direction in terms of diet and in terms of food system for the country and for the citizen. Yeah. So it's the question behind that is how can we make a, a better case on what is a kind of ideal diet for the human beings? Can we also promote the places, the countries, the regions where they have those nice diets and, and look at building uh, backwards the, the food system instead of having a very much harmonized food system all across the globe, which is promoting the same crops, the same type of food everywhere. And we know where it goes. We know this is not sustainable as well. So, I mean, and, that's the reflection that came to me also during this. Uh, and review. I think in the end, it comes down to a question of what do we value? What do we need to value? What do we value now? And how does that have to change? This is why I tried to write the heresies. One of them is about what do we value? That may, maybe to add on that, it's like, um, so we talk a lot about uh, wartime, you know, where, where governments are, are capable, like, to enforce to uh, to their population new way of looking at, uh, at food in a way that it's for the common good, right, and for most of the people. It, currently, discussions in Singapore is to uh, have a, a ratio related to meat consumptions and, and over uh, food that is being uh, imported. Mm -hmm. um, and this is for them to, uh, to look at the carbon uh, impact, uh, but to control as well the, the diet of the population so they came to the most healthy diet. 
Um, this is something extremely new that a country as, as rich uh, than uh, Singapore in the region, without having a war, being able to explore a future where sustainability and what we talk a lot about the hidden costs of, of bad food habits is actually already anticipated as a discussion of future policy. So again, it, that might not work at all in France or of a country, but then, you know, do we really need to need a war or really like yeah. the end of the road to, to have politicians and, and policy that are actually anticipating those those future need. Um, I'm just so saying that. What you, what yeah. Yeah. I think Fonio is one of those crops that people are now rediscovering as something that's also a, a, a indigenous crop that farmers were growing that's resilient to climate change and that's also been grown now in response to saying, well, let's not be so dependent on global markets for nutritious, yeah. for nutritious food, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think what, what you <laughs> mentioned previously, uh, Bram, as well, is the marketing of certain foods, right? Um, obviously, um, based on um, certain global um, interest or, or global multinational companies, right? Um, but we are mm -hmm. starting to realize mm -hmm. that um, the, um, um, the increase in um, uh, obesity, et cetera, and all the health implications that come with it um, need for us to have a rethink with regards to the foods that we eat, um, not necessarily where it is coming from. So, of course, if we are, uh, mm -hmm. we think that, let's say, fonio or pearl millet or finger millet is something that is going to be beneficial with regards to the gut health or with regards to the reduction in obesity, then we need to start, you know, thinking about um, how that can be promoted. You know, yeah. um, so I think those are some of the things that uh, we need to, you know, start thinking about and discussing. Yeah. So that's an interesting one, right? I think that also re re like feeds back yeah. into that whole discussion about, you know, what's what what should be commercialized. Uh, you know, is it about generating profit? And or is can it about... you also add policies? Mm, yeah. Yeah. Marilyn, yeah. Mm -hmm. What policies, policies. you're talking about? I think we could also. Yeah, so policies, we should um, consider what kind of policies we had before and what policies we had now. And maybe, I, I don't know much about your place, if you have um, any differences in your policies regarding food, food policy specifically to be. Like maybe if it has some kind of change from the past to now or something or in the future, maybe I it can also... I think we are almost all back. Good. Um, You're back. Exactly. Back in the same room. How was it uh, for the three other groups? Good. Should we maybe uh, use a minute each maybe to um, give like a, a key insight or key message that is coming from the different group discussion? I'm sure that it was uh, as uh, fascinating that the one that I have. <laughs> so Bram, maybe go ahead and then do it, yeah. Sure. Um, shall, I, shall I briefly, maybe Rodney, actually, maybe you would like to say a few things about uh, what we discussed in our group? Would you be okay with that? Yeah, that's um, that, that's fine. Um, so uh, let me just try and get. Um, I was hoping to get the camera up and running again, but anyway, yeah, I'll, I'll just continue. Uh, forgive me. So um, we we're just talking about you know looking into the past with regards to certain um, neglected and underutilized um, plant species, right? And how we can use that knowledge and that information 
to change our present food systems. So uh, I gave an example of, um, you know, various crops like, you know, your pearl millet, your finger millet, et cetera, that may have beneficial um, um, health effects with regards to affecting our gut microbiome in, in a good way. So essentially taking that knowledge, taking that um, 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 foods and then bringing them to the fore uh, because I realized that, I mean, in the previous presentations, we'd mentioned uh, about the effects of uh, obesity and how it's going to be affecting um, uh, the world uh, economy in the, in the next uh, X amount of years. And so to try and have a change in thinking with regards to um, um, the growing of some of these crops. And we can only do that if we have some sort of um, historical inference with regards to how they were grown, how they were used, et cetera. Yeah, really nice uh, summary, Rodney. And I think one addition maybe from our group is that we were talking a lot about also how it links to climate change. Yeah. And, and that in order to tackle things like climate change and climate adaptation, we need to look back and look at, you know, how people used to tackle these issues. I mean, the example from Nell was about famine, but tackling droughts, tackling, you know, climate issues, we can learn from the past also in order to do that. So that was a brief summary from our group. Maybe from from my group, and I, and I think that I, I like to give the the floor or to um John or to uh, Ervi to give like a a quick insight uh, about how we we look at our discussions. Maybe I can start. Uh, yeah. Just a, a quick uh, insight from our side. I mean, it's. Uh, it's how can we shift paradigm? I think I will translate that uh, what came out from our discussion because it it, it requests a, a fundamental change in terms of uh, how do we uh, manage the food system, but not only based on, on the the inputs or the what what comes uh, into this food system. It's more from a, a customer standpoint, from a from a consumer standpoint, and then so it's. How do we rebalance that? I mean, we, we know this is completely unbalanced. So how do we take more into consideration healthy diet and back to your discussion on the neglected the crops, making sure they will be definitely integrated in the food system at the first place instead of pushing a system which is not working? Well, Sandra, I think you should say a few words. I think you should, say, yeah, you should say a few words. No, but I think like, okay, so I'm just going to quote you then, John, um, because uh, John is working in this very fascinating uh, piece about heresy, right? Um, and and when we talk about heresy, heresy is usually in a very short time of history, right? Is kind of radical thinker uh, back in the time that was courageous or brave enough to say enough, uh, this is wrong. This should not be the main uh, dogma for the rest of the people. Um, and currently what we have and starting the 21st century, we are starting with the same political economy that didn't work in the 20th century. And what we're having right now is the effect uh, the impact, uh, the cost, uh, the damage that are related to a system that never work, that we are capable to demonstrate that never work, that cost even more than if we were capable like to bring in, but we still continue to try to fix a broken system. Um, and that's a very radical moment for us to say we need to shift the way of thinking urgently and join your flow. Well, I, I would just say I, I, I've never said that the 20th century was a disaster. I think it was in some ways an incredibly insightful place. And people, you know, the number of hungry people in the world actually decreased by half yeah. and the population doubled. I mean, you could not say that the 20th century did not have its good points. But the problem is that it's not the model we need for the 21st century. It's past its sell-by date. And that is, I'm not decrying the 21st, 20th century, but I am saying we need to rethink, as happened after the Second War with John Maynard Keynes and Harold Smith, they thought a new, they developed a new economic system to deal with the problems that occurred before the Second World War and which caused the Second World War. 
So we have to do the same now with the problems that we have for the 21st century and not think, you know, like old generals, they always fight the previous war. We, we can't think about mm -hmm. just using this to fight the, to, to, for the, applying what we did in successfully in the 20th century, in the 21st century. That's the heresy. Thank you, John. And went for noted for the 20th century. Let's, let's have one more quick uh, reaction because I'm also looking at time and I think we want yeah. to mm -hmm. have some, you know, closing remark. Um, <clears throat> any other group would like to share what they discussed? Just have one more person to, to hear from. Um, then I, I, our group has not shared its insights and it was actually just the two of us, me and Lillian, who is an economist from the University of Lincoln. And I feel like I've talked enough. So I hope Lillian don't mind me giving the floor to her. Um, Lillian, do you mind sharing a bit of our discussions? Yeah, um, just, uh, just a summary of what we talked about and I need to move to the next meeting. Uh, but yeah, um, I think we discussed the synergies that we have as historians and also as economists, looking at data, looking at narratives that we look into whilst we're looking at futures of food or even looking at the past. And we've had this conversation probably with Matt mm -hmm. and um, thinking about the narratives. And uh, another thing that uh, was discussed was what were some of the narratives in terms of marketing that were either encouraging certain consumption patterns of certain foods and which ones were unsuccessful and how we take those past narratives into the future if we are intending to have certain benefits or certain um, directions in terms of food consumption patterns. And uh, we discussed a little bit about milk and meat and thinking about the alternatives that are people are looking into now and how past is going to inform the future and how can we use that. And uh, the other thing that lastly, just to end, is what expectations we had when we had we came for this webinar is really the, the future. How can we merge the two methodologies and come up with an interesting and an informative narrative? Really nice uh, reflections, uh, Lillian. And uh, thanks thanks so much for, for bringing those two fields also from economy together. I think that really also reflects back to John's comment about you know the need for a new economic model uh, uh, underpinning the food system model as well. Uh, really nice. Um, I'm looking at time and we are at, at time as well. And, and I want to thank everyone who has been with us in this call. Um, Thanks for staying with us also in the breakouts because these inputs were great and, and super valuable. I want to also call out to people who are in this session to, to reach out. If you have more stories, cases, uh, uh, interested to collaborate also with, with Matthew and Nell as they are ongoing in this exploration of, of history and foresight. This is an open invitation. Um, feel free to reach out to, to us, uh, to, to them directly as well. Um, we will be sharing the presentation uh, for, for, for the review as well. Um, the, the recording will be put online um, and we will be also organizing webinars uh, in, in this year as well. And if you have an interest to also contribute to a webinar or co-organize a webinar with us, uh, we'll be very happy to, to have you on board and to share more foresight work within this community. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank everyone. I think this has been a super interesting uh, engagement. Um, I think there's a lot of entry points and interactions that are there. And uh, looking forward to engaging with all of you um, in, in, the, in the coming months and, and years. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot.